Welcome to the Signpost Inn podcast, a space at life's crossroads for a refreshing pause and a bit of reflection. My name is Brandon, and I'm really glad you're here. I invite you to join me and my friends, Matt and Peter, for a friendly back porch conversation about prayer, Christian spirituality, faithful theology, and much more. So pull up a chair, grab a drink, and get comfortable as we start today's show. And when we're done, don't forget to visit us at signpostend.org to find out more about all that our ministry offers. Good to see you, Peter, on the back porch for another episode with just you and me. Glad you're here, man. Yeah, always glad to be here with you, Brandon. It's fun to have conversations and explore. Yeah, I think so too. Our friend Matt is unfortunately unable to join us for this episode, had some family stuff going on. And so Matt, as you listen to this, know that Peter and I are praying for you and we are looking forward to having you back with us whenever you are free to do so. So anyway, this is kind of fun, Peter. This this episode, I'm not sure if this is going to be exactly our 50th episode, but it's going to be around that time. So listeners, you will actually know whether this is our 50th episode or not. Well, hey, everybody, this is Peter editing the podcast here just to let you know that this is, in fact, the 52nd episode, which is equally as awesome. All right. Bye. Which is kind of cool. I I never thought we'd get to 50 episodes. And to celebrate, I want to read a little bit of listener feedback that we've received, which has been very encouraging. I received this from a listener in Ohio He says, your interview with Dr. Kleinig might be the most insightful thing I've heard in a long time. I'm starting it over again because I'm sure I've missed most of it, and I was thinking about its application. I haven't started something over immediately after finishing it since I listened to Mere Christianity, which, wow, thank you. That's high praise. We are definitely not on the level of C.S. Lewis, but (laughs) I appreciate the comment. It makes makes me feel good. So he also said that he listened, this was a little bit later, he said he listened to the series on Psalms with Adam Hensley for the second time. It was good too. Praying the Psalms wasn't a part of my upbringing, and so that's new to me. But what Adam is saying is so good. And actually, I've heard that from a couple of people. Uh, A couple of people that praying the Psalms is not something that they're used to, and asking some private conversations I've had about asking how to pray the Psalms what that would even mean. You know, so many people read the Psalms just kind of gleaning information. So learning to pray them differently has been really powerful for a lot of folks. So listeners, both of those episodes, I highly recommend. Here's two, I want to read two of our comments we've received on Apple Podcasts platform. Some people have been taking me up and I've been asking for them to leave us reviews and several have. This one, I don't know who this is from, but it says... I listened to multiple Signpost In podcasts more than once to catch all the packed in goodness. I think Brandon is especially good at sharing illustrations that help me understand topics in a more personal and genuine way. This podcast helps me refocus on what is really important and encourages my walk with God in deep, meaningful ways. I am immensely thankful. And to that I say we are immensely thankful. That is awesome. So good to hear that we're helping people to go deeper. That is just super cool. I I really love to hear that. Another one from, this one is from the Guido home. It says, I'm almost done binging on another podcast. He says he has a two-year backlog of the Lord of the Spirits podcast, which I've never heard of. And after listening to the first four episodes here, I can tell that this will be my next podcast to listen from start to present. In fact, Presence is a word that comes to mind here. Matt and Brandon are are authentically present, and God is present. May we be as well. Again, thank you. That's Mm. really, really nice to hear. And yes, may we all be present as well. This is from Dustin the Great. Not sure. (laughs) Thank you, Dustin the Great. (laughs) It says, I've listened to several of their latest podcasts, and they're very enjoyable. Thought-provoking, challenging, well-prepared, and entertaining. Definitely worth your time. I'm not so sure that we're (laughs) well-prepared. I I appreciate that comment, but thank you. Uh, Certainly today, I am not sure that we are well-prepared. And 
that's, I think, part of the ethos of this. We started this podcast by saying, hey, this is just the back porch. We're not experts. <laughs> so we want to just have fun conversations that people might be interested in. And I think this one is very, very similar. The topic today is spiritual dryness. And first of all, I just have to say, I kind of hate that term, but it's the term that people use. So we're going to chat about that. So Peter, when we bring up the topic spiritual dryness, what comes to your mind as you think about that? What's just, you know, off the cuff thoughts? So what is spiritual dryness to you? What do you, what do you think of when you think of that term? For me, the first thing that comes to mind is, is all the relational language that the scriptures contain about God and then not being able to relate to any of it. <laughs> like that's, that's kind of the essence of like, I don't know, the feeling is all, I hear Christians, you know, my friends, my family, they talk about the goodness of God. Oh, he's like, you know, my, my, the, Jesus as my brother, my companion walking alongside me, my heavenly father, I can talk to him. And like, they talk about it like, man, this relationship, this ongoing, this back and forth, and the moments and seasons where that just is completely foreign. It's like, I don't, this doesn't feel like a relationship at all. This feels like me tr tr striving, me trying to connect with God and, and I'm talking to the wall. Mm -hmm. there, there's no give and take here. There's no back and forth. Mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of the expressions that resonate for me. And I know that in people with whom I have talked, they sort of resonate with that. Yeah. Of like, yeah, everyone seems to be talking about something and I read it in the scriptures, but if I look at but my I life, feel it. Well, yeah, where is that relationship? A relationship is supposed to be a two-way street, right? Mm -hmm. Yet I don't feel like God has affirmed anything for me or spoken to me in a long time. Yeah, or ever. I mean, I know a lot of folks who feel that kind of or ever. Yeah, yeah. the phrase you said that really caught my attention because it's been something I've thought about is talking into a wall, you know, and I, one of the, one of the inspirations that I've used at some of our retreats is, is an article that it talks about sometimes prayer feels like shouting in, in, into an empty room, hoping somebody will listen. And, and I think this idea of whatever we call dryness in this, in our life with God it's kind of a bigger picture of that. It's not just that my prayers feel like I'm sometimes feel like I'm shouting into an empty room or like I'm talking to a wall. It's sometimes just like, it seems like, I think this is why the word dryness comes up. It's like, it just feels like I'm in a lonely, long <laughs> season of life or walk on the, you know, I'm in the wilderness. Yeah. I'm in the, yeah. I'm in the desert and what's really happening if anything, is anything really happening? And mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's a good, you know, I think people, I think most of us resonate with that. There's this desire for a felt sense, so to speak, of God's presence. Though I, I admit, I don't think, I think a lot of times we don't really know what that would mean. Right. You know what, what is it that we're actually asking for? <laughs> is one thing that I find helpful, actually, as I begin to think, as I've thought about this topic and as I've talked with others. It's like, I feel dry. Well, okay, cool. Yeah, I get it. What is it that you're actually wanting? You know, what is it that you're, if you could, if you could ask for it and God would say yes, what is it that you're, you're asking for? I mean, maybe I'd just toss that to you because I think I might have to think about that too, but do you have a sense of how you would answer that question, Peter? Like, what is it that you're looking for? Well, I think in answering that, I kind of look back to some of the times and seasons where I think that I've felt God communicating to me and, and, and working in my life in a way that I was, he let me see and that I was mm. aware of. And normally times like that function like where I become aware of a certain topic, issue, burden, or feeling, or something, something pertinent to me, important to me. And then my, and then over the next like day or a couple of days or a week, it like seems like that, that, that thing, that theme, that topic rises up and it's, 
and you know, I don't hear a voice, right? I'm, I'm not, mm-hmm. I haven't heard like audible voices like God directly saying to me, but you know, whether it's through the scripture passages for that particular Sunday that, you know, I was unaware of, but it's like that, that's the question that I was wrestling with. Or mm-hmm. frequently I talk to another friend, a Christian friend, and either they express a similar sentiment or I'm talking about it with them and they can relate. And for me, at least the way that I've interpreted that, like that's, that's like, God, I was expressing this to you and you saw me, you heard me. And, and through the avenues of this fellowship or, or the preaching of your word, like you're, even if it's, it's not like, oh yeah, that, that makes total sense. And I understand now it's like you, you heard me. I, because it's coming up here it is again and two or three times you, you know peter that makes me think listening to what this is why i think this question is so pow- powerfully helpful because when i express what it is i want rather than i just feel dry i feel whatever it's like it helps to narrow down what it is i'm actually feeling in the first place and one of the things i hear in your answer is loneliness to be honest, like I think, Absolutely. I, you know, I don't want to reduce all dryness or whatever that I, I think that's part of the reason at the outset, I said, I kind of hate the term is because it's sort of this big, broad, vague term. And then of course, in the world of spirituality, it has like these technical definitions, depending on who you ask, which all just gets very like, oh, let's be accurate about it. But on a personal level, I resonate so deeply with what you're saying. A lot of times what I might start by saying is, boy, I just feel dry as I investigate or as I like express what I'm really wanting. I want friends. <laughs> I want, I want to be heard. Um, I don't want to be alone. And I just, mm-hmm. some, I often feel alone. And I don't think yeah. that's the only thing that people feel in this space. I think there's other feelings that people have. I think some people feel, you know, I've talked to people who feel hurt, forgotten, People who feel, you know, there's a whole nother thing. It's like one word that comes up a lot is frustration. I feel frustrated. And I I have learned to really key in to that word because here's, I hope this makes sense. But you know how like you sometimes say to somebody like, so how, what was that experience like? And they respond with, and I, or I respond with, well, it was interesting, you know, which is a way of saying something without saying anything, right? I mean, <laughs> like I'm telling you there's more going on here, but I'm not telling you what is more going on inside of me. Like I, that was an interesting experience. Well, like, okay, sure. But interesting, good, interesting, bad, you know? And a lot of times that's just because I don't want to talk about it. Like I'm basically telling you don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sure. But this, but a similar thing happens with the word frustrating. I feel frustrated often means I have a negative emotion that I can't really label. I have this negative experience that I don't really know what's going on. And, you know, technically speaking, frustration is like, I'm not getting what I want, or I'm not being able to more specifically accomplish what I want to be able to accomplish. And I think that can sometimes be the dryness, you know, using air quotes here, the dryness that I feel I want more out of my spiritual life. I want to be, I feel like I should be farther down, quote unquote, the path than I am, whatever that path is. And so I feel frustrated. Well, I also could feel angry. (laughs) Yeah. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm mad at God. Some stuff's going on and it's not good. And that's different than frustration. And sometimes I'm sad. (laughs) I'm just sad, hurt. Uh, hard things in my family, hard things in my life. I'm sad about hard things in the world. Anyway, I guess what I'm saying is I don't want to just like launch into a discussion about spiritual dryness as if it's a singular thing that has a singular answer. But I would actually invite myself, I think, and invite people think who, who have the, yeah, this, maybe you clicked on the title of this episode because you're like, yes. I am feeling spiritual, spiritually dry. I mean, one of the things I would say is to start with is what is it that you really want? And maybe take some time to discover the particular nature of your 
off feeling in this time. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. As you were describing those various, perhaps the sources of dryness or or the underlying feelings that, you know, we'd say, yeah, I'm in a dry spot either with anger, sadness, confusion. It seems that a the primary thing with all of those is they often go unidentified. They simply oh, yeah. are, sit under a label of, well, we might not even have the word dryness, but we just say something's wrong <laughs> or I right. don't feel good. I want something else other than this, but we don't have the label. And so what I'm hearing you say is somewhat of the first step is by exploring what you truly want, you might be able to have a better awareness of, of labeling what's going on inside. And, yeah. and, and then the, the topic can kind of shift to, okay, what, how, how is this particular felt need going to be addressed? Because meeting a need for resolving your anger and dealing with that is a lot different than meeting your needs for, for companionship, you know, when you're feeling lonely. Mm-hmm. So I'm hearing that question as very helpful and clarifying what's what's going on inside and and mm-hmm. kind of how to move forward. Yeah, I think so. It's funny I did a as I often do, I just did a Google search before, you know, in in quote unquote preparing for this episode. Thank you very much for saying we prepare. And we do, but but I don't like this is I, I think I said this to you before, Peter, that this is one of those topics that like people are experts in and I <laughs> I am not. But but yeah, it was funny because in doing a Google search, I just put it, I literally said spiritual dryness, go, and started clicking on articles. And as is often the case in your Google searching life, you know, the first five to 10 articles are the most surface level thing you could possibly find. <laughs> and what struck me about all of them in this context of what you just said is that, yeah, there was no nuance. It was like immediately launching into assuming what spiritual dryness is. And they all had a different definition, but it basically all boiled down to, and this is being rather harsh on them, but more or less it, it, it boiled down to you're probably either sinning or not trying hard enough. And you need to do these five steps of more work. Mm. Oof. (laughs) Right. Which... Ouch. (laughs) Ouch. And also, like, that's not addressed to me personally at all. Like, that's... And I just... I guess that's, like, my thought thought is, for whatever reason, you're having an off time. I don't like where I'm at. I'm feeling something negative with God. It's like the first step is to make space for that. Like, because that's what I want more than... Like, one of the biggest things is I feel alone. I feel unheard. I'm... I feel like I'm... Maybe I'm not doing things right. Maybe I'm out of sorts. Maybe I, you know, all these negative things. And I'm not saying that those aren't true. I'm just saying like the first thing that helps to resolve it is actually to validate it. Like it's okay. You actually are feeling this and your feeling of it matters. I think that's like the key to the validation. Even if you're feeling something inaccurate, the fact that I am feeling it and I'm not just a, I'm just not a random character in a novel, but I'm, it's me. (laughs) I have these mm-hmm. feelings, that is super helpful. Yeah, it's receiving permission to feel crummy <laughs> is is really important. Because yeah. I think that there can be, wherever we sort of download these assumptions about the Christian life and what it means to be in a relationship with God, it often feels unacceptable to feel anything less than satisfied right? Yeah. And God. And so, and I think that's partly why it remains vague and unidentified is because the internal dialogue, whether it's realized or not, is if I tell somebody, if I tell my pastor, if I tell my friend, I am not feeling satisfied, you know, they're going to say, well, what do, what do you mean? Isn't Christ in, like, and, you know, when you launch into this sort of like, they're going to respond with the articles that I found. Right. You're not doing enough. You got to do more. And, and like, that's, if that's the response you're anticipating, no wonder you don't want to explore this feeling because it's going to be, you're just heaping more guilt and shame than, than you currently bear for feeling this way. Yeah. 
It strikes me in this context too that that's there is a time I believe for the response to be there need you you might need to do some more things. But the problem one one of the problems that I'm realizing is like when I go to like yeah I go to my friends I go to my pastor I go somewhere and I say look I'm not feeling very satisfied things are going poorly in my spiritual life whatever that means if what I get back is a formula of any kind really one of the subtle problems there is that that makes me formulaic you know that it's I am a generic person that you just hand me the you know you hand me the brochure out of your narthok narthex and not that those things are bad it's just that I think a much a response that is both sensitive and also is the first step in helping the problem is to say, tell me more. Amen. You know, because all of a sudden now I'm not a formula. I'm not just, now you care about me. <laughs> what I'm hearing you say there is that, I mean, yes, there might be situations where, yeah, adopting a particular practice or acknowledging a sin that is really screwing up your life and causing grief and pain and hurt that might be the root of why you're feeling this way. But if that's just the answer that's given to you straight off with no context, just as it would be to a generic person, if you're not feeling listened to and somebody takes the time to say, yeah, tell me more what's going on. Like if you, if you feel compassionately listened to and journey to a place where you realize, oh, wow, it really is a sin mm-hmm. that I'm you know, dealing with. Like that's a much different journey and process than just being told at the outset if you're experiencing dryness you're probably sinning Mm -hmm. yeah because one of those you're a particular person but the other you're just being labeled you're being labeled as you're just a project at that point which is interesting because i find myself treating myself that way Mm -hmm. i want to be i honestly like it's self-destructive of course and it's 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 self-defeating but i In times of dryness or in times of sin or in times of just pain, I have often turned to let me find some articles to read. And it's like, give me the system, give me the tools, give me the... And again, nothing's wrong with those systems and tools in the right context. But I find it interesting now to to be self-reflective and realize what I'm asking for more often than not is like friendship, love, someone, an actual human being and especially God to like acknowledge me and the complexities Mm. of my situation. You know, and that's what I really like. That's what my heart wants, like the deepest need inside of me. And what I then do is like sort of shove it down, ignore it and say, okay, I just need to find the article that's got the five bullet points, Mm. you know? So rather than here being a critique of how other people respond to me, I find it so interesting Mm. how often I respond to me that way. <laughs> and, and there, I, I just use that word. I find it interesting. Let me say that differently. I find it really disheartening that I treat myself that way. I think that's a common dichotomy, right? <laughs> and I know from our conversations and with Rachel and, and Leaf and being in this ministry here, Signpost In, I think <laughs> offers us a particular invitation out of that but also more more opportunities to sort of treat others with the compassion and grace and then when it's like well i'm not feeling well so what i buckle down so yeah yeah i do want to kind of with all of that said it's sort of risky to move on and and maybe talk about some solutions quote unquote but i do think it would be helpful i I don't want to leave the people who clicked on this because they were right. hoping for an answer without some hope. Though though I will admit, I'm not sure that we're going to give you an answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so to summarize so far, I think what we're saying is, and I would like to address this to the listener who did click on this episode saying, I'm experiencing spiritual dryness and I'm looking for an answer. I would like to say that up till now, we've really been stressing and realizing the importance of taking it seriously in the sense that you matter. Your experience of this is not is not silly or wrong. And and if you are allowed, if we can give you permission to explore it, 
there's probably a lot here that needs love, needs addressed. Mm -hmm. And, and you deserve the time, you know, like, or the experience, if you want to put it that way, deserves the time taken. And I think the segue to here's some answers is that none of us really can explore those things, I believe, very easily on our own. You know, find a sensitive, listening, caring person that will assist you in exploring this. Because I know for me, look, I like professionally help people explore stuff like this, and I myself can't do it alone. I am terrible at doing it for myself. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's the healers need healers. You know, none of us are good at doing it for ourselves. So that's what I would say at the outset. I think, and this might be encouraging. It, I have found it encouraging. Part of the reason I started thinking about this topic is because I recently was writing some stuff on on this Jesus's temptation in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And it was really fascinating to me and this has been pointed out by many commentators, but Jesus, he gets baptized, right? And the Holy Spirit shows up in a miraculous way and says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus himself has just been confirmed that yes, you know, he is the beloved son of God. Those who heard the voice have been confirmed. Like this is a really powerfully, talk about feeling the presence of God, right? Bang, there it is. And in Matthew, this is in Matthew 4, the words are, and the Holy Spirit immediately led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Dad gum, yo. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a lot there. But one of the things that I find encouraging about that is this is not uncommon to, all, to us. And, mm -hmm. and we live in the pattern of Jesus. And it is not always or perhaps even especially that you are in a wilderness feeling temptation because you suck. <laughs> it might actually be, and perhaps more often than not, is that I am in a desert being tempted because the Holy Spirit has plans for me. Hmm. I, I feel like that drops the conversation or like squarely into the topic of faith. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. I think that's the whole, maybe not a whole other question, but the question is like, how can I trust that God has good in store for me if not everything he has in store for me feels good? Mm -hmm. You know, this, I feel like that might be an element of, of the dryness is questioning God's goodness through it, mm -hmm. wondering if he, how, how can he possibly be using this experience, which is so isolating or mm -hmm. difficult? How can he be using that for my good? I don't want to. I don't want to necessarily avoid directly answering that question, but I don't know if that's the way to go. No, I think not, that is but... the way to go. I find it. What immediately comes to my mind is some of the imagery that we have in Scripture. You know, Jesus Himself talking about Himself, of course, which, but but again, in that kind of pattern way, like we also experience what you know, Christ's life also lays a pattern for ours. And, and not necessarily, I don't mean that necessarily here to emulate. I mean, like, it's descriptive of the Christian life, of the life like Christ, not the chosen life, just the life that we live. Right. The part in Hebrews where it says he as our high priest has experienced every sort right. of thing that we yeah, would yeah. go through. Yeah. So we can watch Christ's life and it's like it's watching our own, own unfold in front of us. Anyway, so the imagery that comes to mind is him talking about unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies... It remains alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit, you know? And so the imagery of a seed falling from a tree or a plant being buried, dying, quote unquote, it doesn't actually die, right? The idea is that it, there is a kind of death that happens there, a shedding and then a rebir rebirth and the sprouting and the growing. But there is a time of darkness and underground and etc. And obviously that's, you know, Jesus is using a metaphor for his own death, burial, and resurrection. But in a smaller and metaphorical way that we go through that cycle frequently. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is being led into the desert, fasting for 40 days, 
being tempted, coming out of that temptation is a, there's that pattern again. My, my reading this morning was Psalm 107, which was kind of fascinating that that was the reading I had this morning because Psalm 107 is that pattern just gets repeated over and over and over again. <laughs> Mm. <laughs> and it's the it's that it's the psalm it, the story of God's people in different ways so some wandered in the desolate wilderness finding no way to a city where they could live they were hungry and thirsty their spirits failed within them then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he rescued them from their distress he led them by the right path to go to a city where they could live let them give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love And his wondrous works for all humanity, for he has satisfied the thirsty and filled the hungry with good things. And then it's, I'm not going to read all of them, but there's another one. Others sat in darkness and gloom, prisoners in cruel chains, because they rebelled against God's command. And then he breaks those chains and saves them. There's fools who suffer affliction because of their rebellious ways. Then it's, others went to sea in ships conducting trade, and, and the storms come, but God rescues them from that. So there's just this you know, it's cycle of exactly what we're talking about. There's times of hardship and yet the Lord is working in them. What I find really fascinating about Psalm 107 is starting verse 33. He turns rivers into desert, springs into thirsty ground, and a fruitful land into a salty wasteland because of the wickedness of its inhabitants. Then he turns a desert into a pool, dry lands into springs, He causes the hungry to settle there, and they establish a city where they can live. They sow fields and plant vineyards that yield a fruitful harvest. He blesses them, and and they multiply greatly. So God does both. (laughs) Sometimes he Mm. turns a river into a dry land and a dry land into a pool. And there's a cyclical nature to it, but there's also how this all relates to faith in my mind is all of this is God's will in his timing for his purposes. And... The psalm ends with this. Psalm 107 ends with this. Let whoever is wise pay attention to these things. And here's the kicker and the most important part. And consider the Lord's acts of faithful love. Now, this is separate than addressing like the feeling. But faith holds on to that last line. Like that is faith. Mm, mm. These are God's act of acts of faithful love. These aren't just big picture you know, eon scale God's plan being accomplished. Yes, that is happening, but I am in this, in this moment, in this small scale, and he is faithful to me as well. Like he was to his own son, who he led into the desert. The the question on my mind, and you mentioned this a little bit right at the beginning, I was sort of mentioning what spiritual dryness kind of feels like. It's like, it's been so long since I've heard from you, God, and you mentioned, or maybe never. Mm. And I'm, I don't know, I guess that person, someone who's listening and has never experienced that, I'm, I guess I'm wondering how do we, how do we address them? How do we proclaim? Mm. <laughs> how do we deliver the goods here? How do we, or I don't, and I don't know if that's the right question to be asking, but that's just sort of the one coming to my mind. Yeah. I guess we have certain assumptions about our audience, but like, what about the person who says, I have never experienced that moment of like, of faith. What if somebody doesn't have faith? And maybe that's a cruel way to say it, but what if in at least into their recall, they cannot remember a time in their life where they were like, yes, God is for me. Mm -hmm. How would they be able to trust anything that we've just said that, oh yeah, Mm -hmm. he does, he does these things Mm -hmm. for my good. I don't think that's just a question that the person who's never had the felt sense of God asks. I think we, I've asked that question. Yes. You know, and I had a conversation with somebody just the other day where it was like, I can remember having this sense of God's presence and closeness. Now I'm in a space of dryness and distance. And it makes me feel like those since those, those times I did feel close were just fake. I was making it up. It came from me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't real. You know, and the person who's never felt like God was close, I think often has a similar feeling. I you know, I've had it. It's just like, well, it's it's not possible, it's not real. Or worse, other people seem to be able to have it, so something's wrong with me. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, it strikes me, Peter, that once again, the, the question I would ask if I were sitting with somebody who's expressed this would just be, I would, I would, the first question I would probably ask is, well, what do you actually want? Yeah. And, and really carefully, I want to ask that question as, you know, as, in as a compassionate way as possible. Not in a condemning way, but as a opening of a door to actually commiserate with the pain and the hurt of never having felt God's presence or felt like God is for me. Just make space for expressing it. What do you really want? How would you like to feel God is for you? Because that is such a valid need. And honestly, again, not to sound like a broken record, but I think just having someone sit compassionately and ask that question in a compassionately valid way, like validating way, goes a long, long ways towards feeling like God is for you because here is someone who is for me. They want to hear it. They want to understand. The depth of my sadness matters to someone. Mm Mm-hmm. And in a lot of ways, that's kind of the answer I'm most, I'm most often looking for. Then I can have a little hope that maybe God is the same way as this person listening to me. Right. Recently, the topic of how we can relate to the Psalms in our Christian life has come up a lot in, in some of our conferences and, and content. And I, I, I have the feeling it's just very pertinent here, too. I'm even thinking, I mean, you've referenced the idea. The way you sort of can think about the Psalms is almost like a Spotify playlist. And yeah. There's, and, and there is some teaching Psalms and these other things that aren't necessarily a cry out to God in that sense, but a lot of Psalms are. Laments and, and shouts for joy and, and all these different emotions that we experience as humans. And you've just kind of offered that up as like, that's the beauty of the Psalms. You can find one that resonates with the the depths of your own experience and let that be your prayer to God. And and just kind of the fact that that is scripture, that is, these are kind of God's words as he inspired those Psalms. And and so they are acceptable. However raw and vulnerable yeah. they feel, like for me that is translated to into giving that permission of like, no matter how I'm feeling, there's there's an expression that I can find, and it's a faithful expression. I'm not stepping beyond the bounds of something mm-hmm. here, and that can be a worry in my head sometimes. Sure, of course. It strikes me, too, that the we talk about encountering God in his word. It strikes me that that's an interesting way to, like, that's a, that's a powerful way to encounter God's gospel love. The fact that God cares about me personally can be encountered when I, when I, arrive at a psalm that expresses my ho- my my hurt, my soul, my pain, whatever, in a way that's really powerful to God. Not because the psalm says to me, God loves you, but because the word of God expressing my anger or my sadness or my loneliness is a divinely authorized, allowed expression mm. that God yes. receives like beautiful incense in his nostrils. You know, like, there's gospel for you, encountered in the biblical word of God. It's not, a, you know, you don't have to read a verse. Jesus loves you. You can read verses that are like, I'm really ticked off at you, God, and where the heck are you, and why are you? And, and having the confidence that in God's word, that is like, yes, a permitted, valid way to talk to God. <laughs> That's gospel. <Yeah. laughs> Well, I think it, Jesus took the Psalms upon his lips. I mean, you you reference that as a as a Jew, as he would have been praying them all throughout his his entire life. But I think of on the cross, perhaps the most challenging statement that we would feel: you cannot possibly say this to God. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He says, "My God, why have you forsaken me?" Mm-hmm. And 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 that's in the Psalms. That's Psalm twenty two, and and. I don't know, maybe for some of us in those times of spiritual dryness, that's the expression that we feel. God, why why have you forsaken me here? I feel forsaken. And to know that that's in Scripture, that is, like you're saying, divinely, it's acceptable to God. 
Mm-hmm. And he is not ticked or surprised or offended. On the contrary, he is drawn. He's tender. You know, I mean, how could he not be? He has experienced it worse than I ever have. Mm-hmm. He knows how how dark that place is. He knows how hurtful that place is. He knows how how much he longed for comfort. Would he not turn and comfort you? Yeah. You know, he knows mm-hmm. he knows what it's like to suffer the worst and not be comforted, which is why he would never want anyone to have that forever. And so he won't. He does comfort. That's what that's what we find. Now, you know, that can be careful with that because there are people who haven't received it yet. And it's like, well, then why not me? But I would I would say beware. Notice that that's turning it back to. There must be something I'm doing wrong and God is stingy. Rather than the, the eyes of faith, which is there must be a loving faith, you know, a loving reason for this, which, mm. whew, I don't say that as if that's an easy thing to say or believe. I don't mean that. Well, anyway, there's enough there. I, I would like to say one other thing. I think that we've kind of been circling around this and it, it would be good to say one of the... I'll put it this way. One of the things that I've noticed about my own experiences of, of dryness, of feeling like God is distant, of feeling alone, all the various feelings, sad, whatever they may be, those are feelings of des- their desires for connection. You know, that's kind of what we've been noticing throughout this whole conversation. And they have a character to them that is self-perpetuating. I tend to, when I feel alone, interpret that feeling as being the proper feeling for somebody like me who should be alone because I stink and I and I'm not lovable, which then just makes me isolate more. So mm. having somebody to listen to me is really powerfully corrective of that and helpful, which means, and this is where I wanted to go, I would say one of the most powerful practices that one can do in spaces of spiritual dryness is find friends, good friends. Friends who are loving, friends who, you know, not just any friends, you know, this is not the time to go to the bar and find the fake friends who just, but this is the time to go find the, the truly caring friends. In reading some stuff for this, it was really interesting to, to note that the first fruit of the spirit, right? The first fruit that the Holy Spirit grows in us is love. And that's, Yeah. It's like, I feel spiritually dry. I feel sad. I feel whatever I'm in. This is the time to go and, yeah, this is kind of a terrible, I don't want to make this weird, but to go and eat from the fruit of the spirit expressed through the body of Christ, the other Christians in my life, the other people who will give me those fruits of love. They will, you know, I don't have it right now. I am missing a lot. I need it. Go be loved. Go receive love. I think that can be a hurdle in, yeah. for us Christians Cause, because, yeah, I mean, we we are called to be live our life for others as well. And so hearing something like this might be a season where you need to receive yeah, um, is like, wait, if I do that, then I'm then I'm leaving this, you know, I'm lacking in here, which then I can't do that. Um, yeah, I need to be going giving. I don't need to be receiving. It's like, ah, well, you know how the story of Jesus's temptation in the wilderness ends, right? It ends after three temptations. And of course, he resists them as only God can. <laughs> but at the end, he's been tempted, one, to food, two, to tr- test God, and three, to having all the power in the universe if he would just bow to Satan. He resists all three temptations. And then he gets the angels come and minister to him because he was in a space of needing help. Yeah. (laughs) You know, which is, I think in some cases, like it's like a, it's like a reference to which prophet was it in the old, is it Isaiah who lived in the, which prophet was it that lived in the desert for a while? And there was a, was it a raven that came and, you know, God sent ministers to him. So anyway. And and I think you're you were exploring like you said this Luke four passage the other day, 
And one of the things I loved as we were talking about it the other day, you were saying the the story of Jesus is often portrayed here as like an archetype for how we navigate temptation, you know, yeah. and we, right. And, and, and to an extent, yes, the, the fact that it directs us to resist it through clinging to God's word. Amen. But I think what you just said, Jesus resisted those temptations in only the way that God could. Like, it's mm-hmm. not the example for us in the sense that like, buckle up your bootstraps and get through this season of dryness and resist it like Jesus did. Like the fact that Jesus, Jesus did it for us in the sense that like, no, we, we can't, we'll never be in those seasons of temptation or seasons of dryness and handle them perfectly and, and, and just remain completely, you know, reliant on God, but he did it for us. And the fact that that Jesus who has been through it, but yet who compassionately walks alongside us. Like the, there, there's the compassionate tone there, not the expectation that we have to do right. as he did or else, yeah. or else you've, you've lost it. Yeah. Yeah. There's some real relief of, of pressure there. It's like you, I go through seasons of in the wilderness and temptation comes for sure. And again, there's that negative feedback loop and I failed Therefore, I have to go longer. Therefore, I suck. There, I, you know, and it's like, well, I think the message of Jesus going through temptation successfully is he succeeded, so we don't have to. And there's a real compassion of it's going to be. He knows how hard it is, and he knows your frailty, my frailty. So when I don't do what Jesus did in this time of when I do resort to sins or you know, anger. When I do just lose it, he's not like, well, how could you possibly do that? He's like, dude, I know how incredibly difficult it is. And it's okay. The pressure's off because I've already accomplished it without failing. So God's satisfied. He's good. You're okay. And in so doing, God experienced just how difficult it is and has a lot of compassion on you. You needn't fear. You're good. Mm-hmm. You failed. I know. Of course you did. It's all right. That's here's here's some you know <laughs> sustenance for the way. But I, but I would say here here's one temptation that I really want to encourage people to identify and and yell down. Don't listen to the devil who says you need to keep isolating. You need to keep fighting on your own. You need to keep, you better, you got to get yourself cleaned up and fixed up before you go talk to your friends and, and people who love you, because that is, that traps you forever. And the reality is, you know, this is our podcast that we were going to talk about in the future, finding the help and receiving the help. That's when you'll discover, no, you, you don't deserve to isolate. You don't need to get cleaned up before you come. You don't need to fix this on your own before and no one, including God, expects that of you. And anybody who does expect that of you, don't ask them for help. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense, but... It it seems like the, the, the message that kind of, that I'm hearing as we're batting around is like one of, it's, it's okay to be in this place. Jesus was, you know, it, it was tempted and in a, a desert, a literal desert of dryness mm-hmm. and, and hunger and need. And, and so he relates to how difficult these seasons can be in our lives. And so God's tone to us, if we can't hear his exact words, his tone, the way that he looks at me is with compassion, with care, and with understanding. And, and without a, an urgent sense of, you know, like, ah, this, this needs to be fixed. He's, he says, I, I know what this is like. It's going to be okay because my father takes care of us. My father takes care of his children. And I don't expect you to pass with flying colors. I don't require you to never fail it. Trust that I'm good. Even in your failures, you know, go read Psalm 107. You know, even in your failures, I'm at work for your good. That's a pretty powerful thing to really believe that even in my sin and failure, God is at work for my good. 
And that sounds utterly paradoxical, and that sounds mm. utterly impossible to the ears that are tuned to a God who is an accountant. But to the God uh, who is Jesus, to me, that doesn't sound paradoxical at all. It sounds absolutely like it should be. Of course, of course, that's how he feels about my sin. Of course. He's like, I, I'm working even in that for you, particularly for you. I don't know if this is helpful, but it, man, if that were the outcome of a season of dryness to, to know with some, to know with my knower and my soul mm-hmm. that God can even take my sin, my failings, all these complicated emotions that I would view as unacceptable or harmful or just negative. Mm-hmm. He can use that for my good Mm -hmm. like i don't how do you how do you learn how do you come to know that radical grace of god in any other way than Mm -hmm. and i know that i just i don't want that to sound like a platitude and like trite that but i mean if that's the hope if there is a real if there is sort of an expectation that god is that type of god that god can use this and and remind me that nothing, not even my sin can separate me from him, that just might be worth, you know, that just might be the thought that gets me through these days and this season of dryness to go. Mm-hmm. He, he can use even this. I have a poem to read, which I think is a, a, a relevant to this, brought to my attention by, I, I, I participate in a group, what's called group supervision. It's a group of spiritual directors that we help each other. Anyway, there was, this was our, I guess, meditation during the day, like the morning we, you know, we read this as a way of thinking and it just, it seems so relevant to this. It's called the trough by Judy Brown. Hmm. Don't know who she is, but this is the poem. There is a trough in waves, a low spot where horizon disappears and only sky and water are our company. And there we lose our way unless we rest, knowing the wave will bring us to its crest again. There we may drown if we let fear hold us in its grip and shake us side to side and leave us flailing, torn, disoriented. But if we rest there in the trough, in silence... Being in the low part of the wave, keeping our energy, and noticing the shape of things, the flow, then time alone will bring us to another place where we can see the horizon, see land again, regain our sense of where we are, and where we need to swim. And I would encourage people to just hit the back button a few times and listen to that again. The line that really caught my attention and that I think is relevant here is that is that idea, that image of being in the trough between two waves, that you can flail and fight, or you can rest, you can lay lie back, you can you can wait. And and here's the line that caught my attention is that if we keep our energy noticing the shape of things, the flow. And for me that was the that was kind of the thing that that made sense out of this to me is in that times of dryness and those times of sadness and those troughs one opportunity there is there is to notice where god is moving and how he's shaping the story and what things are actually happening and that's like right back to the beginning the opportunity even just to to ask the question what do i really want is to even notice the flow within me and God is God is at work. It's almost like don't fight it, you know, don't mm. resist it. Go with it because this is God's work and he's 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 moving even if you don't feel like it and it does bring us back to places at the top of the waves where we can see again. And I can be like, "Oh, that's how God was working. This is and it may be a huge wave. You may be having to wait many, many years, but there is a time, I mean, it does work that way." Certainly not meant to minimize the experience, but I found that sustaining. Peter, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. Thanks for being here. And listeners, 
We are appreciative of your attention. Would love to hear your feedback on this episode or on any episode. Send us an email, podcast at signpostend.org. Ask us your questions, complaints, whatever it is you'd like to, to throw our way. We'd love to hear it. Yeah, thanks a lot. And may the grace of Christ go with you wherever the road takes you. Thanks for listening. This podcast is a production of Signpost In, a nonprofit Christian ministry dedicated to helping people connect with God and find direction. We offer spiritual direction, retreats, and lots of other resources like this podcast. Please visit us at signpostin.org to learn more. We especially want to thank our generous donors who support our work and keep this podcast going. If you've benefited from something you've heard on this show, please consider supporting us by making a tax-deductible gift at signpostin.org donate. That's signpostin.org donate. And thank you.